Hello and welcome to Database Decision Making with Bibble's 8th edition of Zones of Growth. I'm Karen Brady, Central Region MTSS Lead, and I am joined by my Eastern MTSS Lead, Donna Halpin, and my colleague as well, Western MTSS Lead, Laura Lamont. And those two, along with um, Kelly Cap, will be helping with the facilitation of this session today. This session is being recorded and will be held from 1 to 4.15 today. Our presenters will have a 15 minute break at their choosing um, a natural break within the presentation. Handouts for this session are in the chat box, so please feel free to access those um, now and then also during the presentation. And in, in order to receive Act 48 or confirmation of this attendance today of this session, you will need to attend the entire session and there will be a code that will be provided at the end for um, you to complete. So we do thank you very much for your attendance today and we're really excited um, for our presentation and I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Marissa Pilger Sir is a research assistant at the Center on Teaching and Learning and School Psychology Predoctoral Intern. At CTL, Marissa serves as the Professional Development Coordinator and Lead Trainer for Dibble's 8th Edition where she develops professional development materials and facilitates Dibble's 8th edition trainings for local and state organizations. Over the past five years as a school psychology doctoral student at the University of Oregon, Marissa has gained experience, in, experience providing ongoing professional development and coaching to local school districts, clinic settings, and state level organizations on Dibble's 8th administration and scoring and database decision making the Science of Reading and the Delivery of the Enhanced Core Reading Instruction, ECRI, multi-tiered program. Prior to graduate school, Marissa worked as a teaching assistant for students with learning disabilities and as the coordinator of an elementary school literacy tutoring program, where she provided professional development and coaching to reading tutors and supported the school's response to intervention team. Welcome, Marissa. Um, as well, we have David Virchenick, he is a doctoral candidate in the University of Oregon School Psychology Program. David uh, Fritchanek received his BS in Psychology from the Pennsylvania State University in 2013 before going on to receive his MS in Psychology at Millersville University in 2017. So we have a local presenter, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. During the 2016-17 academic year, David served as a school psychology intern at the Derry Township School District in Hershey, PA, very familiar where he supported students, teachers, and families within a Pennsylvania Department of Education approved MTSS RTI service model. His research interests are primarily supporting schools in the use of database decision making and academic interventions to promote positive outcomes for students with or at risk for learning dif difficulties. So I'd like all of you to uh, help in welcoming uh, Marissa and David today, and we're excited to hear about Dibbles 8 and particularly in the zones of growth. Thanks so much, Karen. You're welcome. Um, so everyone, it's so nice to be here today with you all. Um, as Karen mentioned, this is who we are, just so you can uh, put a picture to our faces. It's, I know, an unusual time when we're all doing virtual trainings. We don't actually get to see anyone face to face. Um, so hopefully this gives you a sense of who we are. I wanted to start out by just taking a quick moment to share some of our um, working assumptions and norms for our session today. First of all, um, we recognize that everyone has wisdom and we need it, and this is a space of mutual learning. So we're really looking forward to hearing from all of you today, and you'll also have a chance to work together in breakout rooms throughout the session um, to share your own knowledge. We also recognize that everyone's time is valuable, so we're gonna try to make good use of our time today um, and also wanted to acknowledge that these are very exceptional times and that flexibility and empathy are important. Um, we recognize that all of you are under tremendous pressure trying to prepare for the school year if you haven't started yet or starting your school year in um, these most unusual circumstances. So we really appreciate the time that you're taking to join us for this session today. In terms of our norms, um, we encourage active listening and engagement throughout the session. You'll, as I mentioned, you'll have opportunities to join with others in breakout rooms to talk through some different database decision-making scenarios. So really looking forward to hear from all of you 
about your expertise in these areas. Um, we'll plan and start and end on time, and that includes our 15 minute break that we'll have in the middle of the session. Um, in terms of questions, if you do have any throughout the session, um, please use the chat box in your Zoom window and um, we'll have Dave monitoring the chat box for any questions related to doubles eight or zones of growth. Um, and then Karen and others will be able to answer any questions that you have related to technology. So please do um, add those questions to the chat box. We'll address any common questions after the break if we have time. Um, and if we don't have time to answer all of your questions during the session, we'll be following up um, with Karen and we'll send out some answers to any questions that were still lingering um, at the end of the training. In terms of cameras and audio, um, in terms of bandwidth and making sure that we don't get all, um, you know, uh, freeze, we don't freeze up during our sessions, please do turn your cameras off during the main session um, and keep yourself muted during the main session. Once we get into those breakout sessions, you'll have a chance to turn your cameras on if you feel comfortable um, and also to unmute yourself so that you can share in those discussions. I also wanted to share just a couple of tips uh, related to Zoom for those of you um, who may not be as familiar. I know a lot of us have been using Zoom a lot lately. Um, we recognize because this session isn't held in person, we can't see you and really interact with you. So we're gonna really be relying heavily on Zoom chat and annotate features. So um, please take a moment to make sure you can locate your chat box and also your annotate feature for your personal Zoom. Um, so the annotate feature is going to be at the top of your screen most likely. Um, you will click the annotate feature up there and it'll open up a list of different um, annotate tools that you can use. We're primarily going to use the stamp tool today and um, if you need to erase you can use this eraser button as well. So we're going to just take a quick second to practice our stamp feature in annotate and we would like to get a sense of who is with us in the session today. So if you could go ahead and find your stamp feature right now under annotate um, please go ahead and mark your role. Um, so are you a school administrator, teaching assistant, instructional coach, specialist of some sort? Great, we've got a lot of instructional coaches today, a lot of reading specialists, new teachers. I, I see a few other, if you can um, just, note in the chat box what your role is if you if you put other great all right so we have a nice assortment of people here today um, so i'm excited to hear what all of you have um, to say re re related to zones of growth um, i imagine we have some pretty um, Expert, uh, experts in database decision making today. All right, so I'm going to clear that screen and move on. So um, additionally, we wanna make sure that you have training materials that you'll need throughout this training. We'll be engaging in some breakout rooms where you'll work through this database decision making activities handout. So we're gonna put the link in, um, in the chat box right now so that you can access it. Um, if, so we could put that link in the chat box. There it is right there, that Google Drive. Please go ahead and open up that Google Drive if you haven't already and access the Zones of Growth Database Decision Making Activities handout. It looks like this. Um, and just open that up, download it, put it in a separate window so that you have access to it throughout the training because in the breakout rooms, we'll be using this, this handout pretty frequently. Um, if you have any questions and you can't access this for any reason, please um, send a private chat to Karen or Donna and they can, um, they can help you access that document. I'm just gonna give people one minute to access that document. Okay, so our training agenda today, we're gonna to try to cover a lot of ground. Um, we're gonna first just set the context for using um, Dibbles within multi-tiered systems of support uh, and database decision-making. 
particularly we're going to be talking today about evaluating and adjusting instruction within the context of multi-tiered systems of support. We'll describe some key updates to Dibbles 8 that can help you with this process. And we'll talk about how to use the Dibbles 8 zones of growth feature to set goals and to monitor progress and evaluate instruction um, within MTSS. We hope that you walk away from today's training with an understanding of the importance of evaluating and adjusting instruction within MTSS, um, learn how Dibbles 8 can support you with this process and give you a chance to apply um, the zones of growth tool to set reasonable yet ambitious goals across instructional tiers, as well as to use zones of growth to monitor progress and evaluate instruction. So this slide really just sets the role for the use of database decision making in education. And this idea that we can apply a systematic problem solving process to answer targeted questions. So in the area of reading, we, we see that many students struggle um, to gain reading proficiency and we need to address this problem. So what we can do is we can systematically ask and answer questions that pertain to how best to address discrepancies between a student's present levels of performance and the reading goals that we've set for them. We don't often think about how extraordinary an ability reading is. It doesn't come naturally. Um, and it plays a really essential role in our lives and in terms of our, our lifelong success. Um, we also see that many students, over 60% of students in our country are reading below a proficient level, according to the National Assessment for Education Progress. Um, so as all of you know, uh, reading difficulties are a challenge that we encounter pretty frequently in our, in our roles as educators. And we might see these problems occurring at the student level, where, for example, an individual student is not making ad adequate progress within an intervention that they're being provided, or it may be occurring at the systems level. So in the classroom, in a school or in a district where students aren't meeting grade level expectations. And when we see this sort of problem at the individual level or at the group level, it can seem kind of overwhelming to know that so many students have these reading difficulties and it can um, be difficult to know where to start. So this is where multi-tiered systems of support come in to help us address these problems. Um, key features of this, of this system are that we systematically set instructional goals for students. We use high quality instruction to help students reach those goals that we've set. And we use data to determine whether students are on track to meet goals or whether instruction needs to be adjusted. We can use multi-tier systems of support to make decisions across instructional tiers. And um, through this process, we collect multiple sources of data to help us make instructional decisions and adjustments. So at tier one, we're using universal screening data to, um, that we collect with all students to determine who will be successful with core instruction alone and also who needs um, additional support, so supplemental or intensive intervention. And then we collect benchmark data at the middle and end of the year as well, just to check in on overall student progress. At tiers two and three, we collect more intensive, uh, we more intensively collect data with progress monitoring data. So we're collecting data more frequently and we're adjusting interventions to determine, um, or we're, we're evaluating interventions and then adjusting them as needed. So, um, we all know that database decision making is really key to MTSS and research has shown us that using data to support instructional decision making can really help us improve student outcomes. Um, so I wanted to introduce this IES practice guide. For those of you who haven't heard of these guides before, they're really great resource um, and provide uh, summaries of data across instructional areas. So. Um, Experts in a, in a given contact er, content area will synthesize the research in that area and then provide strategies for how to implement best practices. Um, so the guide we're going to be drawing from today is this using student achievement data to support instructional decision making. Um, and it provides recommendations for effectively using data to make instructional decisions um, based on expert research, uh, expert recommendations. So the recommendation that we're gonna really dive deep on today is recommendation one, which is to make data part of an ongoing cycle of instructional improvement. And today we'll talk about how to do that using um, the zones of growth tool. So what does it mean to engage in an ongoing cycle of instructional improvement? 
The idea here is that we want to continually evaluate what we're doing to see if it's working, and if it's not working, to make adjustments as needed. And we can think about the importance of evaluating and adjusting instruction over time um, with this real life example of preparing for your high school reunion. Um, so we imagine, you know, your high school reunion is coming up in two months and you haven't seen these people in, in years and you would like to set a goal of losing 10 pounds so you can really make your best impression. Um, so there are a few things that you might ask yourself if, you're, uh, if you've set this long-term goal of losing 10 pounds in two months. First, you might think about which evidence-based strategies will work for you. We know that there are a lot of strategies that you could try that have been previously proven to work. So we're gonna identify those diets or exercise regimens that have been um, found to be effective for others in the past. But we also know that though those interventions have worked for many people, we don't know necessarily which ones will be more effective or most effective for us. So this is where we need to collect data. We need to think about collecting data pretty frequently so that we can determine whether our, um, our strategies have been effective. So we're not gonna wait until the night before the reunion to weigh ourselves and see whether our strategy has worked. Instead, we're gonna monitor our progress more frequently across time, such as every week. And then additionally, we need to think about how and when we should adjust our strategy. You're not gonna try a strategy one day and if you don't see immediate improvement, adjust it the next day and change and change and change every single day. Um, instead, you're generally gonna try a strategy for a set period of time and if it's not working after you've monitored your progress across time, you'll adjust it. So this all applies as well to uh, students and their reading development. So we know that with high quality instruction and intervention, we can help all students get on track to their reading goals. And our goal might be that all students are reading at grade level by third grade. Um, there's also a lot of research we know on effective strategies for improving reading outcomes. And we wanna start by trying these strategies out. But again, we don't know for sure that, um, that the strategy that we try is gonna be effective for every single student. And so we use a decision-making framework within MTSS to help us test out different strategies and to tailor instruction to meet the needs of our students. So today we'll be talking about how to do this at the group level and at the individual student level with Zones of Growth. Thinking about the use of data within MTSS, we're using it to evaluate student growth and adjust instruction by helping us answer key questions. For example, is the instruction that we're providing working um, and to what extent is the student making growth or uh, what is preventing the student from making sufficient growth. And with this information, we can make decisions about whether we need to adjust instruction. And just as a reminder that we can do this across instructional tiers using benchmarking and progress monitoring data. So before diving into zones of growth, I wanted to just share a few updates to Dibbles 8 that can help you with this process of evaluating and adjusting instruction. Um, so I want you all to get out your stamp tool again and just note how familiar you are with Dibbles 8. I want to gauge the audience. Um, so go ahead and let me know, are you pretty new to Dibbles 8, but you know a lot about Dibbles generally? Are you not seeing the entirety of my slides? <laughs> okay, we've got a nice range. See a lot of people who know a lot about Dibbles 8, some people who know Dibbles pretty well, but not Dibbles 8 specifically. So I'm hoping that in our breakout rooms today, those of you who know a lot more about Dibbles 8 will be able to sort of um, take charge and um, help with that, those database decision making activities. All right. So today I'm only going to give a brief overview of some of the updated features of Dibbles because it's not the primary focus of the training, but do know if you have additional questions that come up, you can enter them into the chat box and we'll either answer them now if um, we are able to provide that answer or we'll follow up after the training with more answers for you all. Okay. I'm gonna clear that. So just as a brief, um, overview of updates to Dibbles 8. This is our administration timeline and these yellow boxes indicate um, measures or measure time points that are new to Dibbles 8. 
So for those of you who are familiar with previous versions of Dibbles but not Dibbles 8, um, you'll see that we actually have data that's available for each measure um, at more time points. So we now, for every uh, measure that's available at a given grade, it's available across fall, winter, and spring of that grade. So one example here is nonsense word fluency, which used to start at the middle of kindergarten and end at the beginning of second grade. It's now available for use from the beginning of kindergarten all the way through the end of third grade, which can be helpful if for some reason you need to monitor progress on a specific skill across all three time points. We also have extended certain measures across more grade levels. So this allows teachers to collect more information for more students across our distribution of skills. So again, looking back at nonsense word fluency, for those of you who are not familiar with this measure, this is our measure of um, decoding skills. So students read words that are made up to um, under, get a better sense of their phonics skills. Um, and what you'll see now is that this measure goes all the way up to third grade. Um, so basically we have added additional sound spelling patterns that allow you to um, take a look not only at students who are at risk for reading difficulties, but also students who are more on track if you want to get a sense of their, their decoding skills. Um, our measures also now go all the way up to eighth grade for oral reading fluency and maze. Um, and then also another update to Dibbles 8 is that we have added a measure of word reading fluency, um, which is basically a measure of high frequency words, so real word reading. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. This table just shows you how our doubles measures map onto the big ideas in reading. So we know what those most foundational skills are that research has shown are essential for students to master in order to become proficient readers. And these are these five skills right here. Um, phonological awareness, alphabetic principle, reading automaticity and fluency, vocabulary and comprehension. Um, and these are the doubles measures below that map onto those specific um, foundational skills. These green boxes here show you how, um, show you when Dibbles measures are administered. So what you'll see is that Dibbles measures map on to these big ideas in reading, and they also map on to the important literacy skills um, that are especially important at any given point in reading development. So for example, our phonemic segmentation fluency measure, which you can see here, um, is targeting our skill of phonological awareness and it is administered in kindergarten and first grade um, at the point in time at which that skill is most important for reading development. Um, so we can use all this information as we're thinking about database decision making with zones of growth. It's really important to think about what is the doubles measure that we're using and how, how does that map on to one of the big ideas in reading so that can help us think about um, whether students are making adequate progress toward meaningful goals and whether instruction is effective or whether adjustments need to be made. Dibbles 8 measures um, have also been adjusted in terms of the actual forms for the measures that are available. Um, and we've more thoughtfully um, placed items on our forms. So we have deliberately placed items and sampled items that will allow forms to be more equivalent in difficulty so that you don't have to worry as much about seeing bounce in scores that might occur when you're monitoring student progress. Um, so items are chosen and placed on forms strategically um, and they're they were chosen based on how common they are um, in the English language and they're placed on forms by increasing difficulty based on the frequency of word use in English language, as well as the difficulty of words. So what you'll see within a given form is that um, items or easier items are earlier on the form and you'll uh, see progressively more difficult items on a given form. Dibbles 8 oral reading fluency and maze passages have also been equated which is a st statistical process that helps to um, minimize any, difficult, or any differences in form difficulty. So measure, our, our orphan maze um, passages have always been, um, we've tried to make them as equivalent as possible through readability formulas, but those aren't necessarily perfect. And so what we've done with the equating process is determined what is the average difficulty for each of our passages. And the equating process actually um, 
levels the playing field. So it takes into account the difficulty of a passage and adjusts the student score based on that average difficulty. So that can be helpful when interpreting those scores for you. Um, another thing to note is that while we've tried to make forms as equivalent as possible within a grade level, so fall to winter to spring of third grade, those forms are all going to be equivalent difficulty to help you with monitoring progress across time. Forms also increase in difficulty within each form. Um, so again, you're able to collect information for students who are most at risk while also getting valuable information for students who are more on track. And I'll show you an example of that right here. So this is an example of our updated nonsense word fluency subtest. And as you can see, for those of you who are less familiar, again, this is a measure of nonsense word reading. So we're looking at students' ability to decode um, unknown words. So Dibbles 8 has now um, increased the number of sound spelling patterns that are introduced within nonsense word fluency forms. So in previous versions of Dibbles, we focused just on VC and CVC words, and we now include increasingly complex sound spelling patterns as they're typically introduced in grade level curriculum. So what we see, um, for example, in first grade, um, we'll start introducing long vowel sounds, um, R controlled vowels, um, and consonant blends. And then as we get into second grade, we're starting to look at vowel pairs and more complex word endings. And then in third grade, we start to introduce multisyllabic words as well. Um, another thing that you'll note though, is that though we introduce all of these more complex sound spellings, we're still able to get good information about students who are most at risk because all of our forms start with the simplest sound spelling patterns. So students who are really struggling with reading won't even get to these more complex sound spelling patterns and you'll still be able to get some really good information about, um, about their level of risk for reading difficulties. Another just quick thing that I wanna show you is our um, updated subtest word reading fluency. This targets high frequency words that students should know at their grade level. So this measure includes words with irregular spellings as well as regularly spelled words um, that are decodable, but that students may not have learned the phonics rule for within their given grade. So one example of this is the word mother in first grade. Um, it's not a word that would be decodable for the student in, at the beginning of first grade, but they may see this word pretty frequently in texts, and so it becomes a sight word. The reason that we've added this new subtest is because research shows that students' skills with reading real words out of context can capture additional information that nonsense word fluency and oral reading fluency alone cannot capture. So this graph just shows you here um, students' performance in second and third grade on nonsense word fluency and our new word reading fluency measure. And what you can see here um, basically is um, whether st students performance on each subtest and whether they're be performed above or below the benchmark cut score for risk. So what you can see here is that 84% of students were either at risk on both measures or not at risk on both measures. So with just one of those subtests, we would be able to capture those students who are at risk. However, there also exists 16% of students who were at risk on only NWF or only WRF. Um, so what this tells us is that if we didn't administer both of these subtests to students, we may miss a meaningful number of students who are actually at risk and who might need slightly different types of instructional supports. Um, so that is our new word reading fluency measure. The last couple updates I'll talk about related to Dibbles 8 updates are our composite scores. So we um, allow you to calculate composite scores or a system calculates them for you to give you a more nuanced understanding of students overall risk. The way that this works is that students performance on all of the subtests administered at a given time point are weighted based on their usefulness for predicting future reading risk to give you a more reliable score for making instructional decisions. So this can be particularly helpful if you're looking to identify students who need supplemental or intensive intervention. And then the last feature is zones of growth, which we'll be focusing on for the rest of today, um, which gives you information about what growth is expected to look like for a student based on their initial skill. And so we'll do a deeper dive on that in a moment. 
so I know that was really quick, quick um, 30,000 foot view of updates to Dibbles 8. Um, but if you do have any additional questions, you can add them into the chat box now and um, Dave or myself will try to answer those questions as the training progresses um, or we will follow up afterwards with, um, with answers. But know that if you have a question, you can put in the chat box and you will get an answer to it. If not during this training, then following the training. Okay, so diving into evaluating and adjusting supports with Dibbles 8. How can we use Dibbles 8 to help us with this process? So across instructional tiers, we're using a decision-making framework to answer questions and to make decisions about whether instruction is working for students or groups of students. And we're also using this information to help us adjust instruction. So to do this, we're gonna use a continuous improvement cycle like this one here, where we're monitoring students' progress towards set goals, we're evaluating students' progress toward these goals, and then we're modifying instruction in response to our data. Once we're done with these three steps, we're going back to monitoring progress again. So we're really using this in a continuous improvement cycle. And we're doing this whether we're looking at data at the systems level or at the individual student level. And throughout this process, Dibbles really serves as our GPS. Um, it plays a really key role because it allows us to know where we are. So it tells us what our student skills at this current point in time, um, for example, by looking at our benchmark data. It can help us know where we're going. So what do we want students to be able to do at the end of the school year? So what is our goal for students? Um, and we might look at our goal being the Dibbles benchmark goal for the end of the year, or we might be looking at our zones of growth goal as our individualized goal for a student that is reasonable yet ambitious. Um, and then finally, Dibbles helps us know if we've arrived at our final destination. So for example, we can look at benchmark data for groups of students or progress monitoring data for individual students and see whether students have met those key goals or whether they're on track to meet those goals. And if they're not on track, how far off are they from actually meeting those goals? And all this information helps us to use the data to make decisions about instruction. So we're gonna get into zones of growth now, but I did want to know, given that we have such a wide range of background related to Dibbles 8, how many of you have used Dibbles 8 zone, or have used zones of growth before, maybe even a previous version, um, or have used Dibbles 8 zones of growth? Okay, cool. We've got a lot of people who have heard of it but haven't used it yet, so hopefully this will give you a nice introduction and um, initial um, background knowledge to be able to use it more frequently. And some who haven't heard of it yet, we've got some people who have used it a bit, few people who have used it a lot. Great, very helpful to know. Um, so, just clear. Perfect. Okay, so um, this is my 30,000 foot overview of zones of growth and then we'll dig deeper. So zones of growth um, allows you to compare an individual student's reading growth to a nationally representative sample of students who have the same or similar beginning of year benchmark score. From this information, zones of growth allows you to set realistic growth goals for students um, based on what we know about what type of growth they're expected to make. Zones of growth provides you with several reports that allow you to interpret the progress for indi of individual students and groups of students. And we'll dive deeper into those in a moment. Um, and it also gives you quick access to a summary of benchmark and progress monitoring data for individual students um, if you're collecting that progress monitoring data. The goal of zones of growth is to help us set reasonable and ambitious goals for students and to help us learn whether students have made adequate progress toward those goals. So zones of growth is helpful because it gives us information about the rate at which a student's skills are growing and also gives us information about how that student's rate of growth compares to other students who started the year at a similar place. The idea here is that it would be expected that the average student would start the year at a similar place and make a similar rate of growth. And so by comparing um, how much growth that student has made relative to other students with a similar, at a similar starting point, um, we can 
make inferences about whether the student is making adequate progress or whether they require additional support. So for an example, if a student's growth on oral reading fluency is exceeding the growth rate of 90% of other students who started at the same point that they did, that tells us that instruction is probably doing a pretty good job of helping them meet their goals. In contrast, if a student is making progress at a much lower rate than other students um, at a similar starting point, this would su suggest to us that we need to um, add some additional or more intensive supports. I'm not gonna go into this slide in depth, but just want to show you that it exists. And the big idea here is that the way that we created our zones of growth data is that the, our researchers collected data on thousands of students to determine how students started the year and then to track those students across the year to see how quickly their rate or see their rates of growth. Um, and we use that information to sort students into different categories, which I will show you right here. Um, so how does zones of growth work? Well, based on students beginning of year benchmark performance, double zones of growth sorts students into one of five percentile groups. This is called that student's initial status group. So students with lower initial scores are going to be grouped into a lower initial status bucket. So for example, the lowest 20% of students is going to be grouped into this, this lowest bucket. The um, lowest 20 to 40th percent of students will be grouped into this status bucket, while higher initial status groups are grouped into higher initial status buckets. So we can show you this example here of Zoe. Zoe is a student who received an initial score of on nonsense word fluency correct letter sounds. This placed her in this initial status bucket of students who performed in the 20th to 40th percentile. So what this tells us is that Zoe's initial status is slightly below average for her grade. So once zones of growth has grouped people into their initial status group, zones of growth calculates different rates of growth for students. So for Zoe, who performed in the 20th to 40th percentile at the beginning of the year, slightly below average, um, there were students who also uh, whose rate of growth was similar to many of their peers. So their growth was average. There were also some students who made growth that was slightly above average, and there were some students who made growth that was way above average, so ambitious growth. Um, this here, example raw gain shows you how many more points a student would need to grow from the beginning to the end of the year in order to make average above average or ambitious growth based on their initial status so a student who started the year um, in the same spot as zoe in order to make average growth would need to grow 24 to 31 correct letter sounds across the school year in order to show that they were making average growth to show above average growth, they need to make 32 to 39 correct letter sounds gain. Um, and to make ambitious growth, they need to gain at least 40 correct letter sounds. So that's for a student in the 20th to 40th percentile. But you can see also that the amount that a student needs to grow for average to ambitious growth will vary based on their initial status. Because we expect that students with different initial skills are going to grow at different rates across the year. So in this example, a student who's um, performing at the 40th to 60th percentile at the beginning of the year only needs to make a, growth, uh, a gain of 20 to 26 correct letter sounds across the year to show average growth, 27 to 35 for above average growth, and 36 or more to show ambitious growth. Um, so how does zones of growth then help us with our database decision making process? Well, within this continuous improvement cycle, again, that we're talking about, zones of growth helps us account for the expected differences that we'd expect to see in rate of growth based on students' initial skills, based on the subtest that's being used to monitor their growth, and based on students' grade. So the big idea here is that we know growth is not going to look the same for every student, and so we want to account for this growth when we set goals and evaluate whether instruction is effective for students. So throughout the rest of today's training, we're gonna talk about how to engage in each of these steps within a continuous improvement cycle using Dibbles 8 data and using zones of growth. And just a reminder that throughout this process, it's really important to think to, to um, remember that Dibbles serves as our GPS. So we use Dibbles data and we use zones of growth to help us figure out where we are, where we're going, and if we have arrived. But like a GPS, using Dibbles is necessary, but it's not to actually improve student outcomes. 
we need our GPS, but we also need a car to help us get to the places that we're trying to get to. Um, we may need other forms of information to help us get to our final destination. Um, so similarly, we use Dibbles in conjunction with other sources of data and also our effective instructional practices to help us actually improve student outcomes. So I'm gonna switch this over to Dave now, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit more about collecting and preparing data um, using zones of growth. Okay, thanks Marissa. Uh, Marissa, can you hear me fine? Okay. Can the chat hear me fine? can hear you, Dave. Great. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, so we are. Oh, Marissa, are you did you stop sharing? You're muted. I will. I somehow was not in the session for a little bit. Do you want to share your screen or should I? Sure. Now, are you all seeing the actual slides and not presenter view? Yes. Great. OK. OK, so like Marissa was saying, when we are embarking on looking at a goal, we're going to really rely on our data in order to guide the process. So again, invoking that uh, analogy of using data as our GPS. Um, so the first step in this is we're going to have very specific questions that we want to answer um, when we're embarking on setting goals. So it's really important, as Marissa was talking about, with whenever you're setting a goal, you're taking into account where you started and where you need to get to. So what is the current, um, what's the critical value that you want this student to get to and where are they starting? And then including in that, you also need to ask by when. What is the time frame that is relevant for this student or this context? Because how far they are away from this benchmark is also going to indicate the um, instructional intensity that you need in order to get them there in time. And so some of the important pieces of a goal, we're looking at the measurement that we're using um, to get that goal. Oops, sorry. Um, darn. It is not letting me look at my presenter. Oh, here we go. Okay, sorry about that. So we're looking at the time frame for our goal, the measurement materials that we're using in order to measure progress and how the student's current skills. We're thinking about these specific target learners because this can vary based on individuals, classrooms, schools, or greater. The spe specific skills that we're interested in which is going to tie in directly with obviously um, the measure that we're using. And then of course, the criterion, where do, where do we need to get the student to? So in all of this, we're really talking about Dibbles 8 with zones of growth here, but we want to reiterate how important it is to have multiple data sources to answer these questions. You have a wealth of knowledge of students in your context, um, and you certainly don't want to ignore that even if you're working because every data source and every assessment you might use has its own strengths and limitations. Um, and so you can complement that with different sources. So when we're thinking about setting goals, there are a couple reasons that we would have for setting goals. One, as educators, it's holding us accountable um, for where we want students to get to. And so we can mark, uh, look at our own efforts and see if we got to where we um, set for ourselves. Um, it's also really helpful when we're making systematic decisions for students, are they making appropriate progress? Directly intertwined with that is thinking about, is our instruction that we are providing to the student working? And so you're asking those two questions in tandem to think about, okay, what are we doing in the future? What are we doing right now? And what can we change? So an important part of a goal is it needs to be reasonable. 
So what's reasonable? Well, there's not going to be one right answer. Um, and, you know, leaving out of this discussion today, you're going to really be uh, inundated with just, we're just going to say again and again, there's not always a right answer because there is so much data and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of nuance and clinical judgment that goes into making reasonable but ambitious goals. And our job as educators is to make an educated guess, educated decision for what we want for these students. So when we're looking at what is reasonable for the student, we're looking at where are they starting? What are their initial skills? And you can see in the Dibble system, we're referring to this as their initial status group. Where are they starting? Then we also want to look at what is the student's expected rate of growth. And in zones of growth, we can look at what that actually would look like, where they're going to end up if we put this expected rate of growth for this student. And then we're also thinking about our school context, of course. What can we provide to this student? What interventions are we um, implementing? What does classroom instruction look like? So with all of those in mind, what is reasonable? What do we think um, is feasible? But at the same time, we know that there's the, the power of high expectations. And on the flip side of that, the detriment of low expectations for students. Um, so we know that we need to be ambitious in setting our goals. So something that's important when we're thinking about ambitious is if we're just leaving students on the same trajectory, just looking at a goal but not really um, committing to making a change, we know that that won't be enough. For students who are already behind, staying on the same trajectory is what got them behind. So we need to change the trajectory and improve the instruction that we're delivering, right? And so what's important about setting a goal is we want the goal to be meaningful. We don't want it to just be an increase in the number. Whenever possible, we want hopefully a benchmark status to change their percentile rank to change, or they're meeting now grade level expectations. So what can be meaningful and it, what do we ambitiously want to reach while also keeping in context how reasonable and feasible it is? So when we're thinking about class level goals, we could say, okay, in this class, half of our students are reading at or above benchmark at the beginning of the year. So my goal for my class this year is I want to increase the percentage of students reading at benchmark or above by 10% this year. To me, that seems certainly reasonable. Maybe it's not ambitious enough. Maybe it is ambitious enough. And that's something that the educators and staff in this context would think about um, their own clinical judgment. When we're thinking about an individual student, you can say, okay, this student, first grade, they're currently, they received a score on NWF words read correctly of zero. So on the NWF probe, they weren't able to unitize a single word. We would want to, of course, look at their correct letter sounds and see where that is and use that as context for setting this goal. But you might think in a vacuum, okay, getting them to benchmark at the end of the year of 15 for words read correctly would be an ambitious, possibly reasonable goal for this student. And so when you're looking at this, you're really going to want to be familiar with the benchmark goals because zones of growth derives from the benchmark goals. So the more familiar you are with this, um, the easier it will be for you to interpret and understand and set goals. So the benchmarks are again, telling you the level of risk for students reading difficulties at the end of the year. So in the blue range, the core plus support, those students would likely be very successful with current core supports, negligible risk of reading difficulties at the end of the year. Similarly, with minimal, minimal risk above the benchmark, yellow range, some risk, and red, certainly at risk. So again, the strength of your goal is as strong as the data that you're using to inform it. So our doubles eight benchmark data is really a check in at three times in the year. How are students progressing towards these larger proficiency standards? Then for other students, you may be supplementing that with your progress monitoring data. Those are more frequent checks about specific skills for students who are receiving more intensive supports. And then of course, whenever possible, you're bringing in the wealth of other data that you have, qualitative or quantitative for your students. 
So it's important to remember zones of growth is intended to set individual goals based on our benchmark data. But then we can think about how they're progressing towards those goals using our benchmark and our progress monitoring data. So zones of growth is this tool to facilitate goal making, but then we as educators are looking at other data that can help us determine how are we getting to this goal and what does it look like? What does it look like here? So what measures would you use um, in order to measure your goal? Again, draw back to what's meaningful for this student. And so whenever we're measuring progress for a student, we're thinking about what instruction or intervention they're receiving. So what is the target skill that they're being instructed in? And on the flip side, which we hope would be aligned, what skill are they in need of? And then what skills are most meaningful to measure? The skills are not treated exactly equally at different age ranges. As you saw earlier in the graph that Mercer showed with the different triangles, the um, instructional relevance of different skills varies based on where that student is in the spectrum. We really want to make sure that our early students are, have a firm grasp in phonemic awareness and alphabetic principle. Um, and that's not to say the other skills are not important because we know the big five are important at all time points, but that priority uh, loads differently based on a student's development. And then what is the intensity of the instructional need for that student? What are they receiving and how important it is for them? Is it for them right now? So if we look at specifically when we're measuring class level progress, what skills are we prioritizing in our class-wide core instruction? What are our grade level expectations? We're thinking more of the big picture. What is applicable to all of our students in this setting? And which measures will be most sensitive to student growth? Then you're going to look at that a bit differently when you're thinking about small groups, because specifically, what is our intervention or small group instruction? What is that focusing on? And which measures will be most sensitive to these students' growth? What information would be most helpful for making these adjustments? And what level of intensity are we delivering to these students? So this is general guidance um, of how you might look at what measures you would um, assess with for students. And this is, of course, not a black and white issue, but this is general guidance in most cases. Um, first of all, the guiding principle is you're monitoring progress on the skill that the intervention um, targets for that student. So you're monitoring what you're teaching. So students at risk on nonsense word fluency or alphabetic principle in the first four grades, you're most likely going to measure nonsense word fluency, right? In kindergarten, you're looking at correct letter sounds, words read correctly in one to three, when you're looking at hopefully they're blending and unitizing those words, and then you might supplement your assessments based on what other intervention, again, what you're providing to them, you're gonna guide what you measure. Then you can see throughout the grades, they're not at risk on NWF, you might be focusing on that specific area of need. There's an area of need in phonemic segmentation, you're going to measure that. There's an area of need in oral fluency, you would measure that, and so on and so forth. So now that you have a general perspective of what goal setting looks like, Let's talk about what that actually looks like with zones of growth specifically. Again, zones of growth is our tool that facilitates goal setting, but there's a lot of information that we goes around with that with interpreting, setting, and monitoring progress towards the goal. So when you're inside uh, or on Dibbles 8, the Dibbles website, um, okay, I guess. So you would, you would uh, navigate to this through the home and then data entry and then on the second tab there, there should be you know, zones of growth data entry. Once you're there, you're going through the typical um, menus that you would go through in, on the Dibbles 8 website, setting in your school, class, grade, assessment, things like that. So when you're choosing a measure, again, oh, running this home, looking at the different measures that you can choose in order to set zones of growth goals, we're thinking again about what are we targeting in our instruction? What is our student's area of need? And what is meaningful for this student? So if we look at an example with our composites, oh, actually this example we're looking at, you can see here at the top, top column header, B 
beginning nonsense word fluency, words read correct. So here we are, we're setting goals for these students. We have five students here. The beginning of the year, they uh, unitized or read correctly two to four words read correctly on the nonsense word fluency probe. That put them in here, you can see over here, NFS, need for support, they're in the strategic range. Then you can see that here, so let me start over. So this is walk through it completely. You have our students. It tells you what score they got on this assessment that you chose. It tells you what that score corresponds to in terms of benchmark range. And then you choose what you believe that rate of growth is, what reasonable yet ambitious rate of growth you want to set for that student. So in this example, we've set above average growth for these students. And so then the system shows you for those students who started at that range with above average growth, at the end of the year, they received the goal, this score on NWF words read correctly. And then that score corresponds to this need for support. So in this first row here, Jennifer started it with two words read correctly. If she maintains above average growth, she will read 13 words read correctly at the end of the year. However, that leaves her still in the strategic range. Versus Juliana at the bottom started at four. With above average growth, she should end up at 15 words read correctly, and that would push her into core range. And you can see at the top here, it shows us benchmark goal is 15. So we can look at the speed here to think about what is ambitious. So we're looking at, okay, is ambitious above growth? Is that ambitious enough for our students? And then what is meaningful? We're looking at the goal and the need for support at the end of the year. Is that meaningful for our students? For Jennifer, she's right near the benchmark score. That might be ambitious, but also meaningful for her. For Juliana, I would argue that that is meaningful for her because she's been pushed into core. Of course, that's the least level of okay, but she's at least in core there. Oh, and I had these to help us through. So let's look at setting individual goals more specifically. With an example here, we have a first grader named Jayla. She has a composite score of 320 at the beginning of the year. And so she's receiving intensive level support. Right now, we're giving her 30 minutes of daily tier two intervention, and we're targeting those foundational skills for her, phonemic awareness, phonics, and reading fluency. So on the left here, you can see she's in that lowest bucket, the first to 20th percentile at her grade. And so we can think about, okay, if we have average, above average, and ambitious growth, what do we think is a reasonable yet ambitious growth goal for Jayla? So, when we're looking at the goal, okay, what subtests would we measure for growth? What are her specific areas of need? Well, we can see here she's performing quite far behind grade level in a number of foundational skills. She's our third one here in the table. And we really want to know whether her intervention is improving her phonics skills, which is what we are instructing her in, and her ability to decode unknown words. That's really the meaningful skill that we want Jayla to master in first grade. So for us, the nonsense word fluency, correct letter sounds is a priority for her. But we also know that because she's showing a need in phonemic segmentation, we would also want to measure that because we may see growth in phonemic segmentation before we're seeing that translate and generalize to nonsense word fluency. So if I were Jayla's educator, I would say, okay, I'm going to progress monitor her in PSF and NWF. So what's reasonable for Jayla in terms of setting a goal? Well, we know she's getting 30 minutes daily of tier two instruction targeting the specific areas of her needs. And so we definitely expect that she should be making greater than average growth for her initial skill level. That's really, that's what we need her to be doing. So I would choose a either above average or ambitious growth for Jayla. So when we think about, so we're looking at these measures and we can think about above average or ambitious growth. Okay, so now what is ambitious enough or what is meaningful for Jayla? So we can see here, she starts with a score of 18. 
if she were to maintain above average growth, she would end the year at 46, which would just push her over the cusp into core. If she were to make ambitious growth, which would be great, she would be, she should end up around 56 at the end of the year, which would push her well into core. And so her, her team can think about, okay, what is meaningful yet reasonable for Jayla? If we're really feeling ambitious, really push her farther into core, make sure that we're much more comfortable with her skill level, we could go for ambitious. Okay, so now let's, let's give it a try on your end. So we're going to uh, break into breakout groups. And um, so on the link that you have provided, page one of your handouts, we're going to set you into groups of eight to 10 people. And within your group, answer questions one and two in the part one goal setting first grade example. And so we'll give you some time to discuss that with your group. And when we come back, um, we'll give you a chance to express what goal did you choose and what factored into your decision. I also wanted to note that for this um, first breakout room, you're going to be in the same breakout room with the same group of people across the, the rest of the training. So take a minute to introduce yourself in this first training. Let us know who you are, what your role is, um, and where you're located, and then go ahead and dive into these questions. If you do have any questions, oh, we'll give you about five minutes to work on that. And if you do have any questions um, during the process, you can send us a message in the chat box. We'll start the breakout rooms, Marissa and Dave. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Okay, so as you're coming back, feel free to open up the annotate tool Put a stamp in on where you, uh, where your group or you individually uh, chose for Jayla. And then if you have anything to add uh, as far as what factored into your decision, feel free to drop a comment in the chat box. Um, and Mercer will pull out some key themes from, from the chat. Okay, so in general, I'm seeing a good spread between above average and ambitious. Uh, I'm glad no one chose average. Uh, as far as, you know, when we talk about how there's really no right answer specifically, um, there, are, there are gradations of, of a good answer. So, of course, we want to be reasonable but ambitious. And I think all information that we have here shows that average growth for Jayla would not be ambitious. Now, as far as how you would decide between above average and ambitious, um, ambitious gets her into core. That's great. That's really where we want Jayla to be in the end. Um, but you might think about other factors that you have or you know that, okay, let's get above average and that's an attainable goal for us. Um, so there are certainly things that you can, you can make arguments either way using your clinical judgment. Um, Marissa, are there any themes in the chat that you'd want to add? Um, so I'm seeing a couple people responding in the chat. Um, someone made the comment that tier two is core instruction plus something more. So I think that's a really good point to make that students who are receiving tier two are, should be receiving the core plus tier two. So we'd expect to see them making growth that is above average because they're just getting something more. Um, yeah. And recognizing the difference between correct letter sounds and words read correctly. I think Eve, you bring up a great point that we want to be thinking about tying the actual measure that we're using back to that big idea in reading. And so correct letter sounds is a lower level skill. It's are you able to um, recognize those letter sound correspondences, whereas words read correctly is a higher level level skill. It's are you able to recognize those letter sound correspondences and then use them to blend those sounds together to form words. Um, and there was also a, a question, is average growth ever ambitious? <laughs> Probably not that frequently. I mean, I, yeah, I would, I would say in general, um, 
when we're setting goals for students, we're expecting that they're going to do something more. Like Dave was mentioning that um, if a student is behind grade level at all, average growth is not going to be sufficient to close that gap for them. So I, I can't think of any circumstances in particular that average growth would be ambitious, but there may be a couple instances. Yeah, I, I could think about students who start in, in the blue range, core plus support. If they're staying on track with average growth, that we might be happy with that. Um, if they're staying in core and staying on track with other students who started really high like they did, I could say that would be um, a still a meaningful goal for them. So, okay, great. So now let's think about how we can use zones of growth when we're looking at groups of students and not just individuals. So if you're not familiar with secondary groupings and dibbles, um, if you're new to dibbles or um, have never used this before, I think this is definitely one of those like power user tips. Um, they can be so useful for when you're interested in specific students that aren't just nested either individually or in their um, home classroom. So if you are not use, um, familiar with this but would like to be, there's that link there. And this can be really useful when you're thinking about small groups in tier one or tier two or any other types of students that you're interested in. I'm interested in this group of students, not necessarily this whole grade or class. So let's look at an example for how we would use zones of growth with this first grade classroom. So Ms. Jasper is planning her tier one small group differentiated instruction for students in her orange group. So what tier one, um, what should her tier one instruction target? So she's thinking about, okay, what am I going to deliver to these students? And do these students uh, rise to the level of needing a tier two intervention? And then which subtests will we use to measure growth for these students? So you can see here that it looks like students are really, um, where they are in their developmental trajectory, we're looking at uh, their nonsense word fluency. That's what really sticks out to me and how these students are identifying and attacking unknown words and then blending them and recoding them back into whole words. So I would really look at nonsense word fluency as a measure of growth for these students. So in first grade, we're looking at this word read correctly for these students as one example. So we pull these students from her small group instruction. We're delivering alphabetic principle instruction to these students and good phonics instruction. And so what is a reasonable and ambitious goal for these students? We can see here if we set average growth for these students, if we give them average, if we expect average growth, they're still gonna end up in the intensive range. That's certainly not ambitious enough for my liking. If we're looking at above average growth, okay, we're seeing some growth here, but really only one of them is going to end up at core at the end of the year. With ambitious growth, we're getting these students comfortably into the core range. I'm thinking if I were Ms. Jasper, that's what I want to target for these students, and I want to really make sure that my instruction is tight to get them there. Mrs. Jasper can also think about how she's using zones of growth for her whole class. And so we're going to change the lens a little bit differently when we're thinking about our entire class with a wide range of spectrum of skills and also a more heterogeneous instruction that is being delivered to these students. So what's a reasonable but ambitious goal for these students? So while for individuals or small groups, it might make sense to use subtests when we're setting our goals uh, with zones of growth, but when we're thinking about a large group of students, it makes a lot of sense to use a more global indicator. Um, and one of the best indicators of global risk for students or aggregate student risk is the composite score. So often I would recommend when you're looking at large groups of students, the composite score brings in the spectrum of skills across a number of different students. So what's reasonable for these students? Well, we're thinking at the beginning of the year, only four of these 15 students in her class are reading at or above benchmark, and three of her students are performing in the intensive range. What instruction are we providing her? Because this question is always benched in the context. What are we delivering to the student? So what can we reasonably expect? All of our students are getting that 90 minute core reading block that we know is so important, focusing on explicit and systematic instruction in all of the big five areas. 
Then Ms. Jasper is also providing her small group differentiated tier one in the targeted areas of need for her students. And then certain students are also getting tier two and three intervention as needed. Um, so we can see if we're looking on the right, specifically, it's a little bit small, but you can see, as we identified before, we're looking at nonsense word fluency uh, for her classroom again. And it looks like there's more of a global need for her students really in building that automaticity in recoding words um, and attacking and identifying unknown words. So I'm looking at nonsense word fluency, and it looks like translating that into reading whole words correctly is an area of need for most of her classroom. And we know how important this skill is as students um, encounter um, more unknown words as they grow up in content areas, they need to know how to identify and attack unknown words. So that's what we're going to focus on for her entire class. So let's look at what they would look like at the end of the year based on the different rates of growth. So if we look at average, hmm, I don't know if this is um, I don't know if this is getting us where we want to go. No students are um, changing risk categories for the better. In fact, a number of students are moving into a lower risk category, with higher risk, but lower uh, standard of growth. So that's not what we want from, for our students. Now, if we look at ambitious and above average growth, you can see here looking across the rows, okay, what changes for this classroom? If we have above average growth here, okay, we get a couple students that are moving up a risk category. Um, and then ambitious growth, you can see here, okay, great, we're getting all of our students out of the intensive range and a number of students into the core range. That would be a great um, goal for her class. I mean, of course, in general, you know, ambitious growth is going to be making the most growth. And that's what we want for the students, of course, right? But we're always thinking back to what's reasonable. And it sounds like Mrs. Jasper has a really tight um, instructional plan for our students. I'm sure she has a lot of support from her staff, peers, and administrators in order to deliver a, an effective program like that. So it sounds like to me, ambitious growth is reasonable for Ms. Jasper's class. So what would an actual goal look like for Mrs. Jasper to really make it tangible for her? Well, by the end of the year, she could say that, okay, let's have at least um, at least half of our students reading at or above benchmarks on the double A composite score. If we look back here, um, on the left for ambitious growth, she's accomplishing that if her students maintain ambitious growth. So in order to achieve that, her tier two and three students will need to make above average growth. We sure hope so if we're providing those intensive supports, we want them to be making increased growth in order to catch up to their peers. And we're going to need to provide extra supports uh, wrap around um, throughout their day for these students. Is this reasonable? Is this ambitious? I would say yes. Another example, if you're feeling even more ambitious, is Ms. Jasper can say, by the end of the school year, I will have no students in the intensive range on the composite score and two thirds of my students will, will be reading at or above benchmark on the Dibbles 8 composite score. And this is really what we saw with that ambitious growth. So what does that actually translate in Ms. Jasper's day to day? She's gonna need her tier two and three students to be making above average or ambitious growth and even more extra supports will be needed to provide to these students. So she's thinking about how she can improve her own instruction and also that collaboration with her intervention, intervention teachers or, or assistants. Okay, we are going to break out into a breakout room to look at a whole group uh, example. So go back to the handouts and we'll do another quick breakout room with an example for how you would do this uh, with a whole group goal. Welcome back everybody. If you could please turn off your cameras for the main session, that's appreciated for bandwidth, thank you. Okay, welcome back everyone. As Karen said, um, when you can get in here and you can stamp on what you decided and then add in any other uh, qualitative feedback you had around your decision. Um, one of the discussions that I had in breakout room nine was we were, we were really talking about like, how do you like 
systematically decide between above average and ambitious. Um, and that's really, you know, that's what we hope this, these breakout rooms would inspire is that you can see that there are different decisions. Um, and like I said, there are different gradations of correct. So I would argue in this instance, you know, average is not going to be the correct answer for Mr. Bell's classroom. But when you are in your school and you can think of the different variables that you're familiar with, with the instruction, how many extra resources you might be able to pull in, the history of your students or your class, um, those are what you're using to really push yourself either above average or ambitious. And you're always thinking about um, high expectations, but also reasonable and also I'm using this really as a guide for myself and my team that if we're not making it to the goal, that that's a signal for us to change something. And that's really the power of making goals is evaluating ourselves and what we have done and where the student is going. Um, and so that's really what you want to keep in mind here. So it looks like a lot of people are feeling really ambitious about Mr. Bell's classroom. So that's great. Um, Marissa, do you see any themes of what played into people's decisions? So I'm hearing some uh, talking about the need to drill down more to see what actually is occurring for our different groups of students or for different mm -hmm. students to figure out which interventions need to be put in place. And I think that's a great point. Um, yeah. That class list part of the zones of growth tool um, or actually, so, so uh, one other Dibbles data system report that we didn't go into today, but that Dave has actually been utilizing throughout this part of the training is our class list report, where, as you saw, um, it shows you all the kids in your class and their scores on each of the Dibbles 8 benchmark measures that they've been administered. So you can see um, which students are struggling with which skills and where is that breakdown occurring, so it can help you figure out how to target that intervention. Like in the example Dave gave, there are many students who are struggling to blend words. Um, so that might be a focus of that instruction. Yeah, and I think that question really speaks to the fact that, you know, rarely are we going to just set a class goal and move on. Um, we're, like, like people are pointing out, we will want to dr drill down and think about our small group and our individual level needs. Um, so it's really just one piece of the larger puzzle that you're working with. So that's a, that's a great point. And I also see another another point that I think is is really important to to note that we saw in Mr. Bell's classroom that many kids were performing in the intensive range and that a few of those kids were getting tier two supports, but that's not going to be sufficient to get everyone um, making above average to ambitious growth. We probably in that case want to really look at core instruction and what's being provided there and how we can adjust that core instruction to help students make greater, greater gains across the board. Great. Okay, well then with all of that in mind, um, let's take a 15 minute break right on schedule. Um, we'll give you an extra minute since it's 2.31. So let's do 11, uh, 2.46 Eastern time. We'll come back for a break and do it. Sorry about that. Yeah, I wanted to mention, I'm gonna put this in the chat. Um, this is just a little thought exercise for you. If you have a moment during the break to go to this URL um, that I just posted in the chat box. Basically, it asks you to make a quick note about something that you already knew about Dibbles 8 or Zones of Growth before the training, something you still are wondering about and um, something that you've learned. So if you have a moment to go do that, um, please do as well. And yeah, we'll be back at 2.46. Oh, sorry, I will make sure that you have access to that. together in one more minute here. Hope everyone had a nice break. Um, thank you to many of you for filling out the KWL document. Um, it's helpful for us and we'll do a, a deeper dive after the training to make sure that if there were any questions that you had there that we're able to address them. Um, I did want to want to make a couple of notes about zones of growth generally based on some of what I was seeing there. Um, First of all, I want to recognize that people who are attending this training have a wide range of background knowledge about Dibbles, Dibbles 8, and Zones of Growth particularly, and I know there's a lot of information we're throwing at you. 
Um, the purpose of the training is not for you to walk away from this being an expert with zones of growth, but really just to start to recognize what the features of zones of growth are and how you might use it to make um, instructional decisions for whole classes and for, um, and for individual students. Um, one thing that you might have seen from the zones of growth activities that we've been doing so far um, is that zones of growth focuses specifically on looking at student rate of growth based on their ben on students benchmark um, scores. So you can look at zones of growth data. Um, well, you set zones of growth goals at the beginning of the year based on students beginning of year benchmark scores. At the middle of the year, you'll be able to check in based on students middle of year benchmark scores to see how students are doing. And at the end of the year, you'll again be able to check in and see whether um, the instructional adjustments you've made have actually helped improve student outcomes. So this tool is really intended to be used in conjunction with other tools such as progress monitoring. Um, of course, with our students who are in tiers two and three, we're collecting more frequent progress monitoring data. Um, and you'll be, so you might set a zones of growth goal for a student at the beginning of the year, but then monitor their progress more frequently um, to see whether they're making adequate progress toward, that, toward those end of year goals um, throughout you know, fall to winter. For our students at tier one, we're not collecting as frequent progress monitoring data. So for those students, zones of growth is really helpful at the middle and end of year to give us information about how um, students as a whole are doing in our class. So just something to note. So um, now that we've talked a bit about, um, oh, actually, uh, I, I wanted to make one other note um, about the difference between benchmark goals and zones of growth goals. Um, so as I mentioned, and as we have talked about, zones of growth is really intended to give you um, the information you need to set more individualized goals for students. However, those goals are different than the Dibbles benchmark goals. So Dibbles, um, created benchmark goals, which are intended to tell us how likely a student is to be performing at grade level expectations at the end of the year. So at the beginning of the year, a student will get a beginning of year benchmark score, and that score will place them um, in a uh, specific level of support need. So basically, students who are um, performing lower on each of these subtests will be placed in the at-risk range, which tells us there's a high likelihood that if we don't intervene, they're gonna end the year below grade level expectations. So that will look um, red in the Dibbles benchmark goals. Students who are at some risk for not meeting end of year benchmark or um, end of year grade level expectations will be in the yellow zone or the um, st strategic support range, where students who are in green or blue are on track to meet end of year goals. So on track to be performing at benchmark at the end of the year. So um, that benchmark goals represent one way that you could set a goal for a class of students. Zones of growth um, provides more individualized goals based on student initial skill. So you might set a zone of growth goal for a student that's different than the ben end of year benchmark goal because you might say, well, this student started the year so far below grade level expectations, it's not reasonable even though we're giving them lots of extra support, that they will end the year at benchmark expectations. You might look at the zones of growth tool and see even if I set ambitious growth for this student, their score will not um, be at grade level expectations at the end of the year. But this goal is still meaningful for us because it's getting us to a place where the student is making growth way above average for their initial status. So hopefully that provides a quick overview of the difference between the two. Um, and again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Okay, so um, we've talked about setting goals. We've talked about selecting appropriate data for monitoring progress toward goals. So now we're gonna talk about how to use this information to help us track progress over time and to start to develop hypotheses about why students might not be making appropriate progress in certain cases. So in order to um, interpret our data and develop hypo hypotheses, first we need to identify each student or group of students overall areas of strength and weakness. And then we are going to triangulate data. We're gonna take data from multiple data sources um, and look at it all to help us develop hypotheses about how we might improve student outcomes. So with zones of growth, at the beginning of the year, we're using our benchmark scores to set um, reasonable yet ambitious goals for students. 
And then an, at the middle of the year, we're doing our middle of year benchmark screening. Um, and we're using zones of growth again at this time point to look at data from beginning to middle of the year. So zones of growth, the middle of the year can tell us um, whether or not the instruction that we've been providing has been effective um, because it allows us to see whether or not students are on track to meet their end of year goals. So the key questions we're asking here are at the middle of the year, is the student or group of students on track to meet their goal? Um, and if not, how far, are, how far off are they from meeting their goal? And then we're going to use multiple data sources to form testable hypotheses or educated guesses about why students aren't making adequate progress if they're not making adequate progress. So this is the point at which we might also need to collect other data sources. Um, for example, we might need to also collect information about the instruction that we're providing. So we might need to look at whether the school curriculum aligns with our standards. We might need to look at the way that we're teaching skills and whether we need to adjust that. We might need to look at the time allocated to teaching different skills or other classroom factors that might be impacting student performance. So let's walk through how to do those two things with zones of growth. So when Dave was walking through the um, goal setting section of zones of growth, that's one, feat one um, part of the Dibbles data system website. And again, we're not spending a lot of time walking through how to navigate through the website because there's just um, not time in the, in the um, context of this training. But just so you know, there's a data entry section where you'll enter student goals. And then there's a report section, which we'll look at now, which provides you summary information um, about students' progress from middle to end of year, and then from middle, or from beginning to middle of the year, and then from beginning to end of year. So we'll walk through the summary page, and also the class list page, which are the two Dibbles eight zones of growth reports that you'll be able to use to help you make decisions about whether students are making adequate progress. So um, interpreting individual student data using zones of growth, we're gonna head back to our example of Jayla that Dave talked about earlier, um, who was performing, um, if you might remember, in the intensive support range at the beginning of the year based on her Dibbles eight composite score. Um, so she's receiving tier two intervention that's focused on those areas that she was really struggling with. And we set two end of year zones of growth goals for Jayla. We set one in phonemic segmentation fluency because we wanna see whether her phonological awareness skills are developing based on that intervention. And we set ambitious growth for her. So this means that at the end of the year, we expect her to be performing in the core support range or like at benchmark range on um, PSF. We also set a nonsense word fluency, correct letter sounds goal for Jayla. Um, again, this is our focus on letter sound correspondences because that's another focus of our intervention that we're providing her. And we set an ambitious goal for her as well for CLS. So we expect at the end of the year, she will be um, performing in the core support range, which means to us, if we think about our benchmark goals, that she has low risk for reading difficulties um, if we get her to that core support range. So we can look at our class list report in zones of growth to get some information about whether Jayla is on track to meet her end of year goal. So we set those end of year goals for her in PSF and in NWF CLS. And um, we can look at a few things in this class list report to help us get a sense of whether Jayla's on track. The first thing we can do is look at this quick visual here that shows us months of growth. Um, or sorry, this quick visual here that, says us, uh, that tells us on track to meet goal. So this gives you a quick yes or no, is Jayla on track according to uh, her phonemic segmentation fluency score? She is not on track to meet her end of year goal at the middle of the year. She's also not on track to meet her NWF CLS goal at the end of the year. So that gives us really quick information, but we need to know more to understand the extent of Jayla's need. So we can also use this class list report to figure out how far off track Jayla is from meeting her end of year goal. We can look at this months of growth column here. This tells us what is the average expected growth for student for students in the same initial status bucket. So if you remember, Jayla started the year in the intensive range, so she um, is performing pretty far below um, the average for students in her grade. This months of growth 
tool here tells us that JLA has made 2.5 months of growth. This is the amount of average growth that would be expected for a student with a similar initial status as JLA. So if we think about a school year, there are about nine-ish months in a school year. Um, so this is now halfway through the school year. If JLA was making average growth for someone in her initial status, we'd expect this number to be at least 4.5 because that's about halfway through the school year. We'd expect her to see that she'd made at least four and a half months of growth. She's only made two and a half months of growth. So what we're seeing is that Jayla really needs to make a lot more progress in order to be on track for her ambitious end of year growth goal. We can also see um, quickly where Jayla's middle of year score falls. So again, this is her, um, her benchmark score from the middle of the year. And this is her benchmark score from the beginning of the year. So from beginning to middle of the year on NWF CLS, Jayla made gains of 12 correct letter sounds. We know that by the end of the year, we want her to get to 68 correct letter sounds, which is an increase from middle to end of over 30 um, correct letter sounds. So she's made less than half of that rate of, um, of that number of correct letter sounds growth that she needs to make. So she's pretty far off track from meeting her goal. Something else to note is that Jayla isn't making adequate progress, but we can compare her progress to the progress of other students in her small group. What we see here is that she's, making, she's not making adequate progress, but her peers are. Um, and this is helpful information because if everyone in the group was not making adequate progress, we might want to see what's preventing that whole group from making adequate progress. Um, so we might, in that case, look at implementation fidelity data, to see if the intervention is being implemented as intended. We might look at the content of the intervention to see if it is targeting the skills that students need support with. But in this case, because we see that the intervention is working for the rest of students, but not Jayla, this tells us that Jayla needs something more intensive or different. And so we need to dig a little deeper to figure out what's going on for Jayla. So a couple of other features of the zones of growth um, tool that you can use to access more information for Jayla. Um, if you click on the student name, you can get access to their student history, which shows you basically all of their scores for the beginning of the year and the middle of the year and their benchmark status for each time point. So what we see here is that these are all of our doubles eight measures that Jayla was administered. At the beginning of the year, she was performing in the intensive support range across many of these skills. So we saw she was at high risk for not meeting end of year grade level expectations. So we decided to provide her with intervention to hopefully ruin that risk prediction and get her on track. But at the middle of the year, she's still performing in the intensive support range across most of these measures, telling us that what we were doing wasn't enough to get her to a point where she's at less risk. For students who are in um, this intensive support range and are receiving tier two and three instruction, if you're collecting progress monitoring data, you can also quickly access those reports. Um, and I'm going to show you what that looks like so you can see how you might um, interpret these sorts of reports and see what the zones of growth goals look like on these reports. Um, so our progress monitoring graphs show us how a student is doing as compared to the benchmark goal. Um, again, remember our benchmark goal is um, this means that students are at low risk for developing reading difficulties. They're on track for reading success. And the benchmark goal here is represented by this bullseye. Um, the zones of growth goal is represented by this diamond. So at the beginning of the year, we set goals for Jayla um, that were our zones of growth goals. And these were the goals that we set for her. So what you can see is that our zones of growth goal, goals for Jayla were slightly higher than the benchmark goal because we expected, or her teacher expected, that she'd be able to provide strategic instruction that would help Jayla make that ambitious growth. Um, something else to note from these progress monitoring graphs, this aim line here um, is go being drawn from her, Jayla's beginning of year benchmark score to the end of year um, benchmark goal. So these dots represent each of her progress monitoring scores and they're color coded based on whether the score is above the aim line or below the aim line. So if we look at these scores for Jayla, we see that her, um, her scores are fluctuating sort of above and below the aim line, which tell us that 
um, it's not necessary, uh, uh, based on her benchmark or her progress for her benchmark goal, it's not essential necessarily that we adjust instruction. We may decide to because sometimes her, um, her score is below the aim line, but sometimes it's not. However, if we look at her zones of growth goal, which is higher than her benchmark goal, we see that she doesn't seem to be making adequate progress toward that zones of growth goal. If we look at this, um, her line of, of scores, they're not really um, quite steep enough for her to reach her end of year benchmark goal. So what this basically tells us is if we were looking at the benchmark goal to determine whether or not instruction needs to be adjusted, we may say yes, we may say no. If we're looking at the zones of growth goal for end of year um, expectation for Jayla, we likely need to adjust something to improve her, out, uh, her reading outcomes. So as a quick summary, we saw that Jayla was making well below expected progress toward her end of year zones of growth goal. Um, and we saw that from that zones of growth report that showed us that she was not on track and that her rate of growth is only 2.5 months um, when we would have wanted to see at least 4.5 months. We also see that her rate of progress is much lower than other students in her tier two group. And her progress monitoring data tells us that she doesn't seem to be making quite enough progress to reach her end of year zones of growth goal. So in this situation, one reasonable decision might be to intensify her instruction. Um, to determine how to intensify her instruction, we need more data, um, but we're gonna stop right there now with the, um, with the knowledge that we need to intensify. Um, and we're gonna have a chance to get into breakout rooms one more time. Um, so for this one, you're going to be working with a first grade example, Juliana, who is a first grade student who received a score of four on nonsense word fluency words read correct. So she's in a she has a strategic need for support. She's receiving tier two instruction and she has one end of year zones of growth goal. So you're gonna to turn to page seven and eight of your handouts and look through Juliana's data and determine whether she's making adequate progress um, also determine what factored into your decision. Did you look at her progress monitoring data? Was it because her zones of growth um, report said that she was not on track? And then what instructional adjustments would you choose to make or what additional data would you wanna collect in order to help you make those instructional adjustments? So we'll spend about five minutes in this breakout room as well. So as you're returning back to the main room, if you could again use your stamp tool to mark whether or not you decided that Juliana was making adequate progress toward her end of year goal. And also add to the chat box anything that factored into your decision about whether or not she was making progress. Um, and also either what instructional adjustments you thought about making or what additional data you wanted to collect to help you make those instructional adjustments. seeing a lot of um, people saying that Juliana was not making adequate progress toward her goal. So go ahead and enter in that chat box to what, what made you determine that she was not making adequate progress. And it's nice to see too that you know, there are a few people who say maybe she was making adequate progress toward her goal. Um, so again, there's not necessarily one right answer because you're using a lot of sources of information to help you make your final determination. Dave, are you noticing anything from the chat box that's important to bring up? Yeah, I'm just seeing um, some people point out, like really looking at different aspects of um, her personal characteristics or looking at the targeted instruction. Um, so look really drawing in on other information that you might be able to get a broader picture of what's going on with Juliana. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Yeah, a lot of people are talking about the importance of unitization. I saw, um, I like that people are thinking about not only is she making progress or is she not, but on what subtest is she making progress and what subtest is she not making progress on? Because that can help drill down a little bit more and figure out what we need to adjust about instruction. Um, also noting that according to zones of growth, she's not on track, but according to uh, progress monitoring data, she appears to be trending in the right direction. So looking at those two sources of data, recognizing also that zones of growth, again, um, is looking at students' benchmark scores and the progress monitoring data is looking at their progress monitoring scores. So you might see some slight discrepancies there, but that information is helpful to know. Um, according to zones of growth, she's not on track to meet her benchmark goal, but the progress monitoring data is telling us that maybe what we're doing is actually working. Um, so maybe we just need a little more time in that instruction in order to help her um, to reach that goal. Yeah, I'm also seeing some people point out looking at the instructional context, like how large is her tier two group? How are the other students doing in that group? And how does she compare? Is she getting enough opportunities to respond in that group? So really looking at the context again. And I think Emily, you make a good point. Yes, we would not want to wait to the middle of the year to intensify her instruction um, because she's in tier two intervention where hopefully we're collecting that progress monitoring data more frequently and we're using those progress monitoring graphs throughout um, fall to winter to help us figure out whether she's on track. So as you saw in the progress monitoring graph, you see what uh, you can see what the student's zone of growth goal is. And as you and you're going to look at that progress monitoring graph from fall to winter, whenever you check in, um, you know, monthly or however often you're checking in to see whether she's on track and making adjustments at that point as well. All right, so let's move on. We're now going to talk a little bit about interpreting group level data using zones of growth. Um, and I think this is where the zones of growth tool can really be helpful for classroom um, level progress updates. So zones of growth at the summary, uh, we have the summary report again, that gives us a quick summary of a classes or small groups progress at the middle of the year. It'll tell us which students have growth goals set, whether students are on track to meet their goals and what types of goals we've set for our students. And we'll also look at the class list to help us figure out um, what is going on with each of our individual students to determine whether students are making that appropriate, um, appropriate rate of progress. So at the small group level, um, again, you can create secondary groupings in Dibbles to help you track progress for students. Um, in this example, we're going to talk about a, a group of students that is in tier one, so they're just receiving tier one supports. Um, they receive 15 minutes of differentiated small group instruction within their tier one um, class three times per week. And the focus of their instruction is really building automaticity with word reading and with reading fluency. So Ms. Clark sets an end of year zones of growth goal for the group that's focused on NWF WRC, words read or recoded correctly, because this is our Dibbles measure that focuses most on those blending skills and building automaticity with word reading. So she set an above average growth for her group. So what she did is she went into the data entry tab of zones of growth, set that she wanted everyone to have above average growth. And we know that students are um, gonna make slightly different um, rates of growth based on their initial status. So above average for everyone in her group will mean that everyone in her group at the end of the year will be in the strategic or core support range. So first we'll look at our summary report at the middle of the year again. And summary page gives us a bird's eye view of class progress across the year. What we can see from here is that of the four students in this small group, none of them are on track to meet their end of year zones of growth goal. And all of our students have uh, above average growth rate set. So like I said, she set everyone to above average. So this here just shows us everyone's at above average. If any of these students were actually on track to meet their goal, we'd also be able to see that here in this summary page, just to get a quick sense of who's on track or like how many people are on track and how many aren't. So we recognize from that summary page that 
students are not on track to meet their goals, but that summary page doesn't tell us a lot about why they're not on track or how far off track they are. So that's where this class list feature of Zones of Growth provides us with some more detailed information. So here we can look at students' individual progress from beginning to middle of the year. Again, we're gonna look at this months of growth feature. Again, this is um, what is the average growth for students um, with the same initial status. At the middle of the year, we'd expect to see at least 4.5 months of growth generally um, to show that students are, are on track to make average growth. Because we have above average growth as our goal for students, we'd expect to see that number to be even higher. We also see that students moved from the strategic to the intensive range. So at the beginning of the year, all these students were in the strategic range on words read correct. Now they're in the intensive range. So that's not a great sign. It's telling us that we are not moving students toward um, closing that, that reading gap. And what this is telling us is that students are making um, slower progress than expected. Because average growth would be 4.5 months, we see they're, they're getting close to that but we wanna see above average growth. So we wanna see that number to actually be a lot higher. So that gives us our first sense of what's going on with these students. And now we're gonna go into their progress monitoring data um, to see why this group might not be making adequate progress. Um, and so we can look at NWF progress monitoring graphs for each of these students. Um, we can see according to Ainsley, um, student is actually making pretty decent progress. But if we look at Alejandra, she is not making adequate growth, especially on words recoded correctly. Um, so something more might need to be done for her there. If we look at Soraya and Melanie as well, we see Soraya also doesn't seem to be making adequate growth, um, whereas Melanie seems to be doing a bit better. And if we look at these students' zones of growth goals as compared to the benchmark goal too, we see that they're pretty similar. So um, we can use this aim line and use this color coding to help us say, are students on track or are they not? And again, we see a couple students are on, seem to be on track according to the progress monitoring graphs, while a couple of students seem to not be. So students are making variable degrees of progress. Zones of growth data tells us that students are not on track. Progress monitoring graphs indicate that for some students, a change in intervention might be recommended. Again, we see that there might be a slight discrepancy between the student's zones of growth progress versus progress monitoring graphs, probably partly because zones of growth is their benchmark score and progress monitoring are um, their progress monitoring scores. Um, but in this case, it's reasonable to say we need to adjust the students or this group's instruction because multiple data sources are telling us that at least some of these students are not making growth at a rate that we would expect to see. So you're going to have to get a chance now to go into one more breakout room. This is our last one um, where you'll be talking through Mr. Bell's third grade class. So the key difference here is that in third grade, we have different, um, we may have different measures that we're looking at. So you can see here, because we're in third grade, we're focused more on um, reading fluency. This group of students um, has demonstrated that they still have some need for support with phonics skills as well. So Mr. Bell sent, set two end of year growth goals, one for nonsense word fluency and one for oral reading fluency. So we'll get into our breakout rooms again and think through um, Mr. Bell's third grade class, thinking about is their group making adequate progress? And also is all of the group making adequate progress or are only some of them making adequate progress? Also, what factored into your decisions and um, what additional information would you want to collect to inform instructional adjustments?
So as you're entering, go ahead and mark whether you thought the group was making adequate progress. And then go ahead and add to the chat box as well. Um, what made you decide? I see a lot of people are saying some students made adequate progress, but not all. A couple people saying that nobody made adequate progress. What factored into your decision? And then also what sort of um, information would you want to collect beyond the doubles data to help you figure out how to adjust that instruction. Dave, what are you, what are you seeing from the chat? It's looking like certainly a need for some maybe some more information, um, mm -hmm. possibly an instructional shift to reading fluency being the focus, but looking at more advanced decoding um, or other information to supplement what we're seeing with the progress monitoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second, but thinking about what other types of data sources you might use, you might look at curriculum embedded assessments, you might um, for some students may want to look at some diagnostic or um, in-depth assessments on phonics skills. All right, so it seems like a lot of people are saying some students are making some adequate progress. In this case, if some students are making adequate progress, but not all students are, that might be an opportunity for us to take a look um, at why those few students aren't making adequate progress. Seems like instruction or the small group is working for, um, for some of our students. Uh, so we might want to just collect additional data on those few that it's not working for. This could be a great time point at the middle of the year to start thinking about whether we wanna start regrouping students. Um, is it that the instruction that's being provided has worked really great for some of our kids um, and we want to keep doing that for those kids and providing that same instruction, but for other kids, it's not working anymore. And maybe we need to think about finding other students who have similar needs and regrouping some at that point. Okay, so we will clear that. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about how you can use the same process at the classroom level. So we looked at individual students, we looked at small groups, and now we'll see how we can use those as a growth at the classroom level to um, examine whether instruction has been effective from the beginning to middle of year. So we can use zones of, zones of growth to do a quick check on our whole class to determine whether appropriate instruction has been provided to all of our students. We're going to use those same summary um, and class reports for that. So we're going to think about Miss Jasper. This is her first grade class and think about our, the growth goal that she set for her class that um, Dave talked about at the beginning of the, or, you know, an hour ago in this training. Um, her goal was that by the end of the year, no students would be in the intensive range anymore and two thirds of students would be reading at or above benchmark according to the Dibbles 8 composite score. So what you can see here is at the whole class level, oftentimes we're using our benchmark goals to help us set um, goals for the class because our goal at tier one is to make sure that as many students as, as possible are on track on our reading on grade level by the end of the year. So Mrs. Jasper's goal is based off of that, that those benchmark goals. What we see from this is that um, when we when when Miss Jasper made that goal, that meant that all of her students who were scoring in the strategic or intensive range according to the benchmark goal at the beginning of the year would need to make above average to ambitious growth according to zones of growth by the end of the year. So that means we're gonna need to put in place some pretty intensive instruction to make sure that everyone's needs are being met. So based on that beginning of your goal, first grade team gathered together, created an instructional plan for, um, for Ms. Jasper's class. That plan seems pretty solid to me. It includes um, 90 minutes of core instruction um, in addition to some 
differentiated instruction within tier one. Students in uh, tier two are receiving that same uh, core instruction in addition to 30 minutes of daily tier two instruction targeting foundational skills. And students with intensive need are getting that core instruction, but they're also getting 30 minutes of tier two or three instruction, depending on their need, in smaller group sizes daily. So it, um, we can, the first grade team thinks that this means that that'll be enough for all those kids to make above average to ambitious growth at the end of the year. But we don't know for sure that that's gonna happen. So at the middle of the year, we can check in on students' benchmark goals. Again, we may be more frequently checking in on the progress monitoring data of students in tier two and tier three, but this gives us this overall snapshot of everyone in my class at the middle of the year, how are students doing? This middle of the year check-in tells me that only one third of students are on track to meet their end of year goals. So that's not a great sign. Um, we can look here at the student goals per growth rate and see that Ms. Jasper set above average growth rates for some students and ambitious growth rates for other students. That's these blue bars here. Um, and the green shows us how many of the students who um, had above average goals, goals set, how many of them are on track to meet their end of year goal and same for ambitious growth. So what we see here is that of those 15 students, three of them are um, who had above average goals are actually on track to meet their goals, and only two of them who had ambitious goals are on track. So this tells us at a service level, it seems like the instruction we're providing is not sufficient to meet the needs of all of our students. We can also drill down deeper to look at the class list for more information about specific students. Um, and what we see here is that students on average are making two to three months of growth, of average growth. Um, I know we've talked about how uh, you, you'd expect on average that students would be making at least 4.5 months of growth um, in order to be considered on track. But you can see here that actually some of these students, um, this is suggesting, are actually on track, even though they've made only three months of growth. And this, I believe, is something to do with the composite score and how that's calculated. So when you're looking at the composite score and using zones of growth, really think about comparing students' average month of growth. Some of these students made less growth than others, and that's helpful information for figuring out how we might need to further um, individualize instruction for certain students um, versus being able to keep the same things going with other students. Um, we can see that according to this, a few students are on track to meet their goals, but many students are not on track. And if we look from their beginning to middle of year scores, we see a number of students um, movement across instructional tiers is pretty variable. So some students have moved from intensive to strategic support range, um, which is, you know, good forward progress, while other students have remained in the same benchmark category. Luckily, it doesn't look like any, any students are falling behind and moving back benchmark categories. So that's a good sign. So based on this information, one reasonable decision might be to adjust the classroom's instruction. And again, at this point, we need more information. This is what we keep talking about. We need to um, learn why it is that instruction is not working for all of our students. Um, one other thing to note from here, which is helpful for thinking about how to modify instruction, is that we see students across instructional tiers. So students who were in the intensive support range need, indicating they needed lots of support, students in strategic support indicating they're at some risk for reading difficulties, and students in the core support range are um, students in each of these groups are not meeting their goals. So that's a sign that something might need to be done at core to really boost everyone's um, performance. So in our continuous improvement cycle, our last step is modifying instruction. At this point, it's the middle of the year, we've determined who instruction is working for and who it's not. And we need to start thinking about making adjustments to instruction based on that information. So we're going to allocate instructional time and resources to the most pressing content. We're going to think about um, ad adapting things. So maybe we're adjusting our assignments. We're adjusting the way that we teach. We're um, thinking about how we're providing feedback to students to help us make appropriate adjustments to help improve student growth. 
So we're going to use our responsiveness data to help us adjust or maintain current instruction. And we're going to do this, we're going to figure out what adjustments to make based on our hypotheses or educated guesses about what's going on with our students. So based on our educated guesses about what's happening, we're going to identify instructional adjustments that we can make. And then we're going to monitor students' progress um, toward their end of year goals again to see if those adjustments actually helped change their rate of growth and helped get them on track to meet end of year goals. So how do we identify a research-based instructional adjustment? Um, well, we're going to triangulate data to form testable hypotheses about why students aren't making progress. So remember earlier we talked about how Dibbles is our GPS, right? It tells us where we are, where we're going, and wh where, whether we've arrived there. But we need additional sources of data to help us figure out why it is that a student or group of students is not on track when, when Dibbles tells us they're not on track. So we might need to look at a variety of sources of data to help us figure out which adjustments will help our students reach their instructional goals. Now, this isn't the primary focus of our training, but I did want to bring in uh, this idea that we need to start thinking about what can be um, preventing our students from making adequate uh, instructional improvements. And there are many things that we could be thinking about. So this is the point at which we're thinking about, okay, what additional data do we need to collect to figure out why students aren't making progress? We could be teaching the wrong instructional content. Maybe we are focusing on reading fluency with our students, but everyone needs support with more basic phonics skills. We might need to adjust our instruction a bit. We might be teaching the right instructional content, but we're not teaching it with enough, enough explicitness, um, and so students aren't getting enough opportunities to practice. We might be teaching the right instructional content in the right way, but we just don't have enough time in our school day to teach it constantly maybe time is being cut from core instruction. Um, we might need to look at implementation fidelity. Do we know that we're using an effective program and teaching in an effective way or should be teaching in an effective way but not everyone is teaching to the level um, that it's intended to be taught at? So we might need to adjust instructional fidelity some. Or there might be other issues that are coming up that are preventing students from making growth. And so we need to think about all of these factors and what those factors are may differ based on your setting. Um, and the key to this is that we want to uh, look at environmental factors that we can actually alter because that's how we'll actually be able to identify key strategies we want to we want to try out and monitor that progress across time to see if um, that results in instructional improvements. So using these range of data sources, we're going to make hypotheses about why students aren't making adequate progress. This, these are just a few examples of possible data sources you might use based off of those questions that I was asking on the previous slide. Um, again, not going into depth on these, but you might want to say, um, if you have the question of whether you're, you have sufficient time allocated to core instruction, you might want to look at a systems level evaluation. If you're not sure whether instruction is being implemented as it's intended, you might want to look at implementation fidelity observations and collect that data. If you're not sure whether the curriculum is teaching the appropriate content, you might do a curriculum evaluation. If you think all those things are in place, but students are still just not mastering skills, you might want to look at any um, curriculum embedded mastery data that you have to see, are students actually mastering the skills that I'm teaching, or do I need to provide additional reteaching and certain skills? Um, and you can also look at things like Dibble's error analysis or more diagnostic data. So you might look at a phonics screener if you notice that a lot of kids are really struggling with phonics skills. Um, the key here is that you really want to identify data that will help you make instructional decisions. So there's no point in collecting the data if you're not going to use it for some purpose. It's really thinking about what data sources do I need to use to help me answer those questions. Then once you've collected all that data and developed a hypothesis about why students aren't making adequate growth, you start to adjust instruction. And again, this is not the primary focus of this training, um, but I did want to mention that you will be thinking strategically about which aspects of instruction need to be adjusted. And these are just some examples of the different ways you might adjust instruction. The goal here is really to say, based on data, which evidence-based strategies are most likely to improve student outcomes. We wanna think what's gonna give us the best bang for a buck, what is reasonable within our school context, um, and what can we actually do to improve student outcomes over time. Um, this can seem like an overwhelming task. <laughs> you might 
feel at this point that you have a pretty good sense of whether or not students are making adequate growth, but not know then how to change that instruction to help students make adequate growth. This National Center on Intensive Intervention, um, Intervention Intensification Strategy Checklist is a really nice tool that you can use to help you think about the ways in which you might want to adjust instruction. And it gives you examples of exactly how you can adjust instruction based on each of these different types of instructional adjustments. Um, so you can track what it is that you're actually adjusting. These are some other resources as well, and you have access to this PowerPoint, so you can go and look at these resources later. Um, I think these are helpful resources for starting to think through how you're going to actually individualize your instruction, what instructional strategies you're going to use once Dibbles has told you that students aren't making adequate progress. So switching back to zones of growth, we're going to say, you know, at the middle of the year, we've determined students are not making adequate progress. We've collected additional sources of data, decided what we're going to do to adjust our instruction. Um, and now we want to see whether our adjustments actually helped improve student outcomes. So at the end of the year, we can also use zones of growth to interpret student data and say, were the instructional supports we provided sufficient to help all students? Or, um, and if they were sufficient, great, we can continue to do that next year. If they weren't sufficient, we can start to plan for next year and think about how we're going to adjust instruction more to actually meet the needs of all of our kids. So we can do this. We're going to look at Ms. Jasper one more time. So um, at the middle of the year, we determined that about half of her kids or two thirds of her kids were not on track to meet their end of year goals. Um, so Ms. Jasper discovered that from her zones of growth data and her team decided that they need, needed to collect additional data to figure out why students weren't making adequate progress. So in the middle of the year, the first grade team collected some implementation fidelity data because they wanted to make sure instruction was being implemented as intended. They collected a curriculum evaluation to just make sure that the, um, the skills that were being taught in the curriculum matched up with students' instructional needs. And they looked at some curriculum embedded mastery data. So there was some um, program data that Ms. Jasper had collected throughout the first half of the year to see who was mastering skills and who is not. Based on these data, Ms. Jasper decided to make a few adjustments to instruction. So she's going to increase the level of explicit and systematic instruction that she provides during core. She's going to add in some supplemental lessons in foundational skills that were missing from that core instruction. She's going to provide more opportunities for students to respond across tiers. She's going to increase her use of mastery data to help target the specificity of small group instruction. So identifying which skills students are still struggling to master at the end of a week and then reteaching those skills. And then for just those students who are demonstrating profound need, um, she's going to collect some additional data, um, in-depth assessment data to figure out what exactly they need to help individualize. So this is a lot of stuff that she's planning on doing. She is very ambitious and has a whole first grade team that's there to help her make these adjustments. Um, at this point, it's really important to recognize that the same that you're not necessarily going to make the same adjustments in your classroom. Um, it's really important to think about what do we know is going to be evidence based and give us the most bang for a buck while also thinking about what is actually reasonable in our context. Um, and also thinking about during this current period of time, what is reasonable given um, students who might be in virtual settings receiving instruction, students who might be in a hybrid setting receiving instruction. So thinking about what's reasonable yet ambitious. So after Ms. Jasper has made those changes, um, we can look at our um, end of year data to determine whether students are making adequate progress. What we see is that approximately half of students have met their goal. Um, if we look here, seven out of 15 students have met their end of year goal. So we're doing better than we were at the middle of the year, though still haven't um, gotten to the point where everyone has reached their goal. At the end of the year, we also, um, in our summary report, again see how many students had above average goals and ambitious goals. And again, these are the same as middle of the year. We see that slightly more students have met their goals, four of the students who are in the above average range and three of the students who are the, in the ambitious range. Um, 
And we also see at the end of the year, this is specific to the end of the year zones of growth report, we see how students actually grew across the year. So this end of year growth percentiles um, chart here tells you for students who started at uh, in each initial status, what rate of growth did those students have? So regardless of the initial status that students were in, um, students, and most students in Ms. Jasper's class made really great growth. So six students made um, growth that was well above average for their initial status. Five students made pretty decent above average growth for their initial status. Three students made average growth for in their initial status and one student made less than average growth for their initial status. We can also again look at our class list report to get more information. And we see here that students on average made eight and a half to 12 and a half months of average growth. Again, this tells us, again, nine and a half or nine months is about average for a school year. So students who made more than nine months of average growth are probably um, doing a little, are, are, are gaining skills at a rate that's more expected given the additional intensifications we've provided. We see also at the end of the year, again, this is specific to the end of year report, that you can get access to growth percentiles. So this tells you, again, um, of the students who were in that initial status, at what rate did this student grow compared to other students in that initial status? So if you look at Eliana here, she um, made growth that was well above average for her initial status um, category. So she made really great growth. She was growing more than 80 to 99% of students who started the year at the same place as she did. We also see from this class list report that many students moved up a benchmark category. So students started in starting in the red, either stayed in red or moved up to yellow. Many students starting in yellow moved up to green and so on. And another helpful piece of information here is we see from here that about half of students met their goals. But if we look here, we can see what their actual, um, the score that would be required to meet that end of year goal is, as well as what their actual end of year score was. And what we see is that for many students who didn't meet their goal, those students actually came pretty close to meeting their goal. So for example, Amy here, her end of year score was 433 and her goal was 435. So though she didn't meet her goal, she came very, very close. So that's helpful information to have. Um, one last piece of information to note is that um, if we look at growth percentiles here and at who met their goals, we're seeing that a lot of students who were in the strategic to um, core support range were the ones that met their goals. So students who were sort of in the um, middle of that distribution are the students who are making the most growth which tells us that we might need to provide additional supports to students who are well below, who are reading well below average, and students who are um, doing really, really well and might need accelerated instruction. So overall, instruction was moderately effective for students in Ms. Jasper's class. Um, instructional adjustments appeared to have led to increased student progress across the board overall, but we do notice that instructional supports might need to be provided to some students, particularly those students with lower initial skills and for students with very high initial skills. So from this information, we can start to think about how to plan for next year. How can we improve instruction so that we're meeting the needs of all of our students? And again, at this point, we might need to gather additional sources of data to help us figure out why it was that certain students made growth and certain students did not. So, that takes us through the entire continuous improvement cycle using zones of growth. I wanted to acknowledge that um, this process is again an ongoing process. So we are constantly collecting data, evaluating that data and making adjustments to instruction. At tier one with our um, students who are only being benchmarked at beginning, middle and end of year, we're doing those checks at the beginning, middle and end of year with zones of growth. For students who are in tier two and three, who might be being progress monitored and getting more frequent, um, monitored more frequently, we're gonna make more frequent adjustments. And we can use those progress monitoring graphs through zones of growth to help us figure out whether or not students are on track to meet their goals um, before we reach the middle of the year. Because it is really important to adjust instruction for students um, once we see that things are not working for them. 
So big ideas from today's training really are that it's important to evaluate and adjust instruction in an ongoing cycle of instructional improvement and zones of growth can help you with that process. Remember zones of growth is a focus on those benchmark scores. So it can help you set reasonable yet ambitious goals for students um, at the beginning of the year. When you're setting zones of growth goals, it's also important to look at um, those end of year benchmark goals and see what is my zones of growth goal for my student? How close is that gonna get them to that end of year benchmark goal? So you're creating goals for students that are meaningful yet ambitious. Um, and zones of growth also helps you interpret data for students across the school year, especially at those key points at the beginning, middle and end of year. And lastly, remembering that zones of growth is intended to be our GPS. Um, so we're using it in addition to other data sources to help us figure out what exactly needs to be adjusted and how we're gonna adjust that instruction. But then we use zones of growth to help us figure out whether the adjustments we made are actually, have actually proved to be effective for our students. So if you have any questions about zones of growth or the DIBBLES data system, you can always contact our customer support team. They're very friendly and available. Um, they start work, I think at like 6 a.m. Uh, West Coast time. So they should be available for you at the beginning of the, the workday. Um, and they can provide really valuable information, particularly around how to navigate the DIBBLES data system so that you can access all these zones of growth features. Um, and I'm going to end my show right now, um, but I believe that there is, um, Karen's gonna share some more information with you, but I'm gonna post um, a link I'll stop sharing. I'm gonna post a link in the chat box with a feedback survey. We'd really value um, your feedback on this training so that we can make adjustments to it in the future to make it more effective for people. Um, and at this point, if you have any questions that we can answer, I think we have a, a few more minutes so we can definitely take some questions now if there are any. Marissa, would you like those questions to be put in the chat? Oh, yes, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We're getting a lot of thank yous. <laughs> and also, just so you all know, in the Qualtrics that I sent out, there is a space for you to ask any additional questions that you have. So if you um, you know, don't have one right now, but you want to think about it for a little bit and then add them, we will follow up with Karen to answer any of your questions at that point. Okay. Well, well, thank you so much on behalf of the MTSS initiative and Patton. Uh, we really appreciated your, your thorough explanation of zones of growth and, and how teams can use this information for data-based decision-making. It's a reliable and, and valid system as an option for school teams for screening and progress monitoring. And you know, zones of growth is you know, another piece of that puzzle that helps to make more um, reliable decisions about kids. So we really appreciate everything that you've done and shared today. Um, I would like to offer that the recording of this session will be available in the future on the Patent YouTube channel. So possibly you have some administrators or other educators that you would like to share this information with um, that may be making decisions about, you know, database decisions as well as uh, systems to uh, chart or enter your data. So this would be available as well. Um, we have, I'm going to share my screen. We have an exit code for you today. Um, if you are want Act 48, you'll need this code as well. If you need just a, a, you know, a certificate that says that you had an attendance, maybe you have an administrator that you need to share that with. So this is our only record that you did attend today. So we would appreciate that you would um, fill out this um, Google form and I'll share that now. And would you appreciate Marissa and team that um, you will be available to um, take a look at questions in the future. So thank you so much.